embarking on a rather strange topic tonight. We're going to talk about UFOs. Now, this is an area that uh, most people tend to relegate to the demented or incompetent or fringe type people. And yet, uh, the entertainment industry, of course, has uh, picked up on this with the uh, 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 crop circle thing called Signs, which may, many of uh, you may have seen. And also, uh, Steven Spielberg did a mini series called Taken, focusing on the abductions and so forth. And uh, while these things are interesting entertainment, they are replete, of course, with all kinds of misinformation and, and uh, legends and uh, half-truths that get mingled with facts so that it's uh, really just entertainment. But one of the things you and I have to face is uh, what is the real reality here? Is this just a bunch of nonsense, a, a composite of hoaxes and, and pranks by various people through the years? Or is there something really going on? One of the things we want to explore a little tonight is are the UFOs real? And if so, where are they from? What's their agenda? Are they friendly or hostile? And uh, more, most important, what does the Bible say about them? So we're going to explore that tonight as we go forth on our exp exploration of UFOs and the strange term, the Nephilim. Uh, what is that all about? But before we start, since we are dealing with a very, very complicated area, an area where many of us have already formed opinions, let me remind you of the, there's a principle. According to Edmund Spencer, he, he articulated this, there's a principle which is a bar against all information. It's proof against all argument. And it's something which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is condemnation before investigation. So one of our challenges as we go into this very complicated topic is to set aside our prejudices and presuppositions and let's see what we can uh, find out. Now, the same idea is not only uh, articulated by Edmund Spencer, but it also is in our uh, uh, collection of Proverbs by Solomon, who reminds us that he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So one of our challenges tonight is sort of set aside what we think we may have heard or what, we, what our basic prejudices are, and let's see what we can find out that might be new. Now, many of us, of course, have seen photographs, many of which are hoaxes, contrived, and so forth. Uh, there are many of these in the literature. I'm sure you've seen all kinds. Uh, the problem is, is that not all of them are. It may surprise you to learn that there are over 3,000 authenticated photographs in the classified community that are uh, authenticated. So what's really going on here? See, the, the problem we have in researching this area is there is so much that's uncorroborated. There's a lot of deliberate disinformation and certainly a lot of data which is unreliable. And uh, the problem is when you strip away the hoaxes and you strip away the nonsense and you set aside the uncorroborated, there still is too much to ignore that is substantiated that involves multiple reliable witnesses, including multiple radar sightings. And uh, radars generally don't have hallucinations. And uh, this idea of being plotted simultaneously on multiple radars is something that should get our attention. And uh, now, I'll give you one example. Back in, on June 18th of 1997, there was a strange vehicle that appeared over Phoenix, Arizona. In fact, went over most of the state at about 30 miles an hour, which is very slow for an airborne vehicle. There were some that said they felt they could have hit it with a, a, a ball. It seemed that close as it went over. And it created quite a stir. And um, on March 13th, there were, there were uh, uh, sightings uh, all the way uh, from Casa Grande and Chandler, all the way up through uh, the northern part of the state, Prescott and so forth. So there was a, it wasn't just a local phenomenon, and uh, it created quite a stir. Now, the governor of Arizona made a big mistake by treating a press conference the following morning lightly as humor, and it didn't go over very well because people were upset because they were getting stonewalled by the government. Uh, even though there were denials by the Air Force, they saw the fighter jets... Uh, 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 sorry after them and so on, so it, it created quite a stir. It wasn't picked up in the national media 
It was picked up, of course, substantially in the local media, that is, in the state of Arizona. And uh, one of the things that's strange about this is that it happened in March of, of, uh, uh, of uh, 1997. It didn't show up until June 18th. And for, what's, what's strange to me is not just the event that happened in March, but there was no word about it in the national media. But then for some reason, some no obvious reason, on uh, June 18th, it was on the front page of USA Today. That's where this picture came from. It was on the, uh, NBC, CBS, CNN, all the major networks had this brief comment about what happened, what was puzzling about it. It didn't happen on June 18th. It happened back in March. And I haven't been able to determine what triggered the news media to make it a big event at that time. It's one thing it does demonstrate is how the news is managed, because all the networks pick it up at the same time uh, for no ostensible reason. Um, but as we talk about these kinds of things, sooner or later, we have to focus on the Roswell incident. And uh, many of you realize that approximately July 4th, a few days following maybe, some object, that's in 1947, some object landed near Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, Sheriff George Wilcox contacted the Roswell Army Airfield um, regarding wreckage that was discovered on Max Brazel's ranch or in, in that area. The Army seals off the area and confiscates everything that was there. And uh, on, on the 8th of July, uh, Colonel William Blanchard, who was commander of the 509th Bomb Group, that was our primary atomic bomb group in those days, uh, he issued an official press release stating that the wreckage of a crashed disk had been recovered. Now, this press release went out early enough on July 8th to be picked up by 30 newspapers across the country. And so it is. And this is a, a, a snapshot of uh, what it looks like. The RAAF uh, captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region and so forth. And no details of flying disc are revealed, et cetera, et cetera. Except within hours, something very strange happens. A second press release, which it tried to rescind the first one, was issued from the office of Brigadier General Roger Ramey, who was commander of the 8th Air Force. At, and it, uh, he resides at Fort Worth uh, Army Airfield in Texas, which is about 400 miles away from the incident. But within hours, General Ramey issues a countermanding release, and he claimed that Colonel Blanchard and the officers of the 509th uh, at Roswell had made an unbelievably foolish mistake that somehow they incorrectly identified a weather balloon and its radar reflector as the wreckage of a crashed disk. Now, frankly, everyone that heard this, that thought about it a little bit, realized that was just a very uh, uh, contrived cover story. And uh, uh, it, he, this press release that, in effect, hit the next day by General Ramey uh, caused, you know, it was in effect a denial, uh, did not explain why they confiscated everything, why the whole subject has been classified to this day. And uh, now that, what that really did, this absurd cover story, frankly, just fueled the uh, 50 years, the intervening 50 years of conjectures and all kinds of anecdotal testimonies of people who were involved peripherally. All kinds of stories have been echoing uh, uh, throughout the, the, uh, this half century that's transpired since uh, July of 1947. And the stories typically maintain that there were four alien occupants of this uh, 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 disk, that for three of them were dead, one was still alive, all these presumably were taken off to the, uh, uh, the never never land of military security and there's all kinds of stories that are too preposterous to really accept and yet uh, it continues. The great mystery about, uh, uh, well, every, when I travel, one of the most often questions I get is what really happened at Roswell? Well, we don't really know what happened at Roswell. It's been classified, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We do know something that happened nine months after the Roswell incident. Al Gore was born. <laughs> and, <laughs> And it turns out he really was. The Roswell incident occurred nominally about July 
uh, the days following July 4th in 1947. His birthday is March 31st of 1948, and that makes it a cute quip, because every audience has always seemed to enjoy that kind of a crack, and obviously I'm not being serious uh, uh, that there's a linkage, really. But um, in any case, there is one reason I want to dwell on this a little bit, because for 50 years people have conjectured what really happened there, and the Air Force has contrived one thin cover story after another over the years, each one sillier than the first, each one easily refuted by anyone that does a little homework. So you wonder, why is this thing still classified? Several presidents and se uh, half a dozen congressmen have tried to crack the security surrounding Roswell to no avail. What could have happened there that is still to this day regarded as an item of national security? And uh, now, f interestingly enough, just in the last uh, few months, there appears that we now have what some people would call the smoking gun. There is some tangible evidence that's finally emerged that there was a crash of some kind and it did have victims of some sort. You see, when General Ramey at Fort Worth issued that cover story, there were, the press was present and many pictures were taken. And James Bond Johnson of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram was among them. And on July 8th, he took a photograph which a number of the photographs happened to show General Ramey clutching a sheaf of papers in his hand that apparently was a communique to Washington, D.C. And he happened to have it in his hand while he was going through this explanation and, and demonstrating that this really was a weather balloon. They had some props there that they showed and so forth. Well, it turns out that was in July 47. Since 1947, we've made a lot of progress in digital imaging technology. And this sheaf of paper that was uh, uh, photographed was analyzed with a, dig uh, uh, a digital photo scanner and enlarged and, and enhanced the words printed on the folded piece of paper. And then using a program for digital enhancement and analysis, it's now been reported on Associated Press on November 22nd of the year 2002 uh, that uh, David Rudiak was able to identify several key phrases on that sheaf of paper that General Ramey was clutching during that press conference. There's a phrase, the victims of the wreck, and also the phrase, in the disk they will ship. Lots of other words that were uh, hard, to, you know, more conjectural is what they said, but the point is here's a communication in his hand going to Washington that speaks of victims of the wreck and speaks of a disk that they're going to ship while he's covering the story that, that, that uh, Colonel uh, you know, Blanchard was all mixed up, this is just a weather balloon. So finally, the, the UFO researchers have something tangible to go on, because up till now, it's been a spooky thing. Let's shift a little bit from 47 to July 19th through the 26th, about a week, in 1952. I happen to remember this vividly, because in June 30th of 1952, I was entering the United States Naval Academy, so I was a plebe uh, or I should say, yeah, plebe at, um, uh, at Annapolis uh, when this was in the papers and much talked about at the time. It turns out a number of UFOs harassed Washington National Airport, which in those days was the only airport there. We didn't have Dulles. This is before Dulles. And uh, also Andrews Air Force Base. So badly they had to shut down the air traffic. And this went on and off and on for a week. And it was in the papers because every time the Air Force would alert jets to investigate what these things were, they would disappear. As soon as the jets landed, they came back. And uh, uh, fiery objects overrun jets over Capitol in the Washington Post. These are headlines from that period. Now, one of the things, there again, they never really explained it. They issued some cover stories, but the truth of the matter is they didn't know what it was, and it wasn't just an incident one night. It went off and on for a better part of a week. Again, a it created a problem just in blocking all the phone traffic because everybody's calling what's going on and so forth, and, and so something real was happening. Because you're talking here multiple radars. This isn't some, you know, impressionable, uh, unprofessional observer. This was uh, the Air Force Air Controllers at the Washington National and Andrews Air Force Base. And uh, never explained, at least not to the public. 1993, there, you know, by the way, there are thousands of these things to select from. I've just picked a few that seem representative. Yeah, over in Mexico City in 1993, the population by the thousands were uh, upset and disturbed by what went on. 
Seoul, South Korea, November 23rd of 1996. CNN and Reuters reported a huge cigar-shaped UFO that was televised for 10 minutes on national television. You know, when we talk about witnesses, there's all kinds of people, many very reliable professionals that have contributed to this background, but the ones that you and I would tend to presume would be the most reputable, most trained, and most uh, competent in this area would be our astronauts. You think they know something about it. Do you realize that 13 of them have gone on record uh, of seeing UFOs while they were doing their missions? Uh, Ed Mitchell, Apollo 14. April 1996, and it was, this was on uh, Dateline NBC. He said, NASA <clears throat> is covering up what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico. See, this isn't just the presumption of some journalists or the, or the tabloids at the check, you know, checkout stands in the market. These, <laughs> these are serious people saying that something is being covered up. Astronaut Gordon Cooper has made many talks. On May 15th of 1963, he did the 22-orbit Mercury capsule. He saw a green UFO, which was also at the same time he saw it tracked by, our, uh, by the radar in Australia. It corroborated this. And he's testified before the United Nations that UFOs are visiting this planet. And uh, in May 1996, he said, we are being visited by aliens. So he said, he's spoken a lot about this, so much so that some people tend to write him off. James Lovell. Frank Borman, <coughs> Borman, excuse me, Gemini 7, December 1965, on the second orbit of their two-week flight, they saw a UFO. Gemini Control presumed it was the stage of their own Titan booster, but they indicated that they had both the booster and the UFO in sight, so that doesn't quite jive. Walter Schirra, these are all familiar names to most of us. Mercury 8, 1968, he was the first guy to use the term Santa Claus, to indicate UFOs are near the space capsule. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, was about December, so everybody thought that this was just a cute quip, but it was a code word. And this was, it was later, uh, in 1979, Maurice Chatelain, the chief of NASA communications, confirmed that the Santa Claus phrase was a prearranged code word to deal with the UFOs without alarming the public. And uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, these familiar names to you? Are these guys competent? On Apollo 11, July 21st, 1969, both apparently saw lights in and on a crater, and there, there are unconfirmed reports that there were other spacecraft there. Some of this is classified, gets classified quickly, so we're, tra we're treading on dangerous ground. But they have said two large objects were watching them. And Armstrong is quoted in some reports of a CIA cover-up. Now, those reports get uh, squelched, of course, so you, it's hard to separate what was just, you know, urban legend and what really happened. But if you go to Ed White, James McDivitt, James Lovell, Borman, Sherrod, Gordon Cooper, these guys are all, have all reported UFOs. Neil Armstrong, Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11, Ned Mitchell, Apollo 14, and on it goes. And uh, one of the most interesting ones is John Blaha. He was a veteran of five space shuttle missions. He also was a relatively recent resident of the Russian Mir space station, this a few years ago. Uh, March 24th of 1989, an amateur radio operator picked up an exer uh, a, a intercept, about, uh, said, Houston, this is discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft under observation. And uh, very impressive to listen to that soundtrack and hear if the familiar voice uh, say these rather strange things. So UFOs, we could go on and on. The main point I'm trying to do at this point, just indicate there are some people that you would consider competent and reliable in multiple names that are reporting these things are real. And I would not attribute all of these to hallucinations or being impressionable or what have you. In fact, if you start looking into this area as an area of research, you'll find it extremely difficult because there are 6,000 professional publications in English alone that deal with this. There are 2,200 foreign publications, 1,350 UFO-related periodicals. And some of these, if you look at the books in the library, there are over 700 books that deal with UFOs just in the period from the 17th century to the First World War. Excuse me, the Second World War, from 1650 to about 1945. There are over 300 books prior to the 17th century that deal with UFOs in the ancient times. So what on earth is this all about? You know, they've done polls. Do you realize that 57% of Americans, according to the polls, believe in UFOs? That's 
doesn't make them real, but it says there's some phenomenology that must be real, even with just perceptions. 15% of Americans believe they have seen a UFO. How many of you in the audience have seen a UFO at one time? Okay, we're not going to take names. I just care. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> Here's the shocking one. This blew me away when I first ran into it. The, the, somewhere between 1% and 3%, various, various polls agree, somewhere between 1% and 3% of Americans claim that they have had an abduction experience. That's over 5 million people, or in that neighborhood. Not a few thousand deranged people, not a few, you know, disaffected. This is, uh, we'll talk a little more about this. This is a, this is a very, very disturbing phenomenon in the, cons in the counseling uh, profession. Now, part of the problem of the UFOs is they have some paradoxical behavior. On the one hand, they're seen by multiple competent witnesses. They are plotted on radar, sometimes multiple radars simultaneously. They leave tangible traces on the ground, sometimes radiation, evidence of burning and other things. So they are apparently real in the sense of being physical, on the one hand. There are photographs. Sometimes they show up on photographs, sometimes they don't. But here's the problem. They do, while they seem to be tangible on the one hand, they exhibit behavior that can't possibly be physical. They can go in excess of 6,000 miles per hour without sonic boom. So what on earth does that mean? I'd like to know how they do that trick. They've been plotted making right angle turns at over 16,000 miles an hour. That defies the laws of physics. That's a, now the more, and, and the, perhaps the most disturbing thing of all, they appear to have the ability to materialize and dematerialize without a trace. One of the great mysteries of the UFOs isn't seeing them, is trying to figure out where are they when you don't see them. Some people say, well, they're from another galaxy. There's lot, uh, most physicists will debunk that for lots of reasons. They seem to pose that way, but for lots of, if they came, you know, if, they, if there are that many coming from another galaxy, you think you'd sense the traffic. We'll come to back with some more reasonable uh, explanations, and you're going to discover. The, the two top researchers in the, in the last century, really, is uh, Jacques Vallée, France, and uh, J. Allen Hynek, the American. Now, J. Allen Hynek was uh, head of astronomy at, at Cornell, and he set out to debunk this nonsense about UFOs, and he became one of the most ardent, competent, balanced researchers in the trade. Jay Allen Hynek, he, he died a few years ago. Uh, uh, those of you that saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, whether you realize or not, saw J. Allen Hynek because he, he was in the crowd. Uh, I was on a board in those days with Alan Adler from Columbia, and, and uh, they had him as just a gesture appear in some of the scenes, just as, a, as an extra. And uh, uh, the lacum of that, uh, of that piece of fiction, of course, was patterned after Jacques Vallée, the Frenchman. Both of these respected researchers came to the conclusion that they're not intergalactic for lots of physics, there are a lot of physical, uh, physics rebuttals to that conjecture. They both argued that these things are demonic, their term. They've written many, many books. You can uh, check them out. These are not uh, uh, religious people. They're not people with any kind of personal agenda. But they came to the conclusion that these things, on the one hand, and, and by the way, we, we take for granted that we strip away the nonsense and the hoaxes, set that aside. There's tens of thousands of files you have to wallow through. When you, when you cut through all that, there's still a core group, a substantial core group of real events that need explanation. And uh, so on the one hand, they exhibit physical properties. On the one hand, on the other hand, they also violate all physical laws. And so the conclusion from that both J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée and others have come to is that they're hyperdimensional, that somehow they come from another dimension periodically. That causes us now to stand back a little bit and, and do a little tutorial on uh, hyperspaces. And, uh, uh, and, and we're going to get into uh, why we feel that the Bible is an authenticated message of extraterrestrial origin in the first place. So let's talk a little about hyperspaces. There are only two kinds of, a hyperspace, by the way, just a term for a space of more than three dimensions. You and I are familiar with two-dimensional space. It's called a scratch pad or a, a, a photograph or a piece of paper is a two-dimensional representation of something, typically. 
uh, three-dimensional space we're familiar with because we live in it and we also build models in three dimensions. We probably have a vague feeling of a fourth dimension called time. We don't get too comfortable with that unless you've done some special study, but we sort of acknowledge that reluctantly. Hyperspaces, frankly, is just the term used to study spaces of more than three dimensions. And we discover there's only two kinds of people that can really relate to hyperspaces. And that's mathematicians with special training and small children. Okay? Because they haven't the... Uh, their, their prejudice has been blindfolded, so to speak. Now, the one book that is second to the Bible in its publication, all of us know the Bible is the most uh, uh, popular book in the history of man, but the second to that would be Euclid. And that's where most of us have been taught in school. And most of us, when we went to school, had trigonometry or, or plane geometry, same subject in a sense, uh, we all know that a triangle, if you add up the angles, a triangle adds up to, adds up to how much? Anyone? 180 degrees. 180 degrees, you betcha. So if I have a 30, 60, 90, it adds up 180. If I have a 45, 45, 90, in fact, any triangle, if I add up the, the angles, it would add up to 180. Suppose, though, that my partner and I went out to a large field here, and we, and we very carefully laid out with the transit a very large triangle, and when we got back with our uh, figures, we added up the three angles, and it added up to more than 180 degrees. What would you conclude? That we'd messed up, huh? No, what, we've, what, we've, what have we encountered? Anyone? The curvature of the Earth, exactly. See, if you take a course in navigation, one of the things that you'll have to get some background in is spherical trigonometry, where you can have a triangle with 90 degrees in each corner. And so, see, when, when we, this little rule that we all learned that a triangle, uh, you know, a, 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 by, by implication, a plane triangle, a, a, a flat plane, adds up to 180 degrees, that's only true for a universe of two dimensions. So when you find that rule violated, it's a hint that you've encountered an additional dimension. And uh, so, uh, if, uh, uh, Dr. Einstein made history with that insight. Because he was grappling, of course, with the nature of, of space, and, and uh, he realized that length, mass, velocity, and time are relative to the velocity of an observer. Uh, in 1915, he generalized that, basically discovered that there's no distinction between time and space. And perhaps the most important thing from the th general theory of relativity, we, don't, we won't get in the math, of course, but it to, is to realize that time itself is a physical property. You and I do not live in three dimensions. We live in at least four. In fact, we now discover much more than that. But uh, this idea that Einstein recognized as he grappled with the properties of space that there's a, an additional dimension required, and he went to four dimensions to resolve the time issue. And uh, his theory of relativity has been uh, uh, confirmed over 12 different methods to over 14 decimals. So it's no longer really a theory. Uh, it's it's, it's well-accepted basis in... Uh, in certain fields of science. So when we go, be, we need to go beyond Euclid, which of course deals just with three dimensions. And uh, in June 10th of, 19, of 1854, the most important lecture in mathematics was given by George Riemann. He invented a thing called metric tensors. And uh, that tool that he developed proves to be one of the most profound tools um, in advanced physics. And it took uh, uh, over 50 years in fact, over 60 years, for Dr. Einstein to use that tool to develop his four-dimensional space-time. And it's too bad that Einstein went to his death frustrated by not being able to solve certain problems, which if he had applied the technique going to five or more dimensions, they would have yielded. It took his successors to do that. Because in 1953, Kaluza and Klein both developed more than four-dimensional uh, models, which integrated light and supergravity. Uh, in, in, the, in a model. In 1963, 10 years later, Yang and Mills both developed what they call Yang-Mills fields, which reconcile electromagnetic and nuclear forces that physicists are pursuing some way to integrate all that we know about the physical universe into a common model. And uh, so the, in, uh, in uh, as early as eight, 1984, and it's still a current conjecture because there's a lot still problems with it, but uh, scientists now generally believe that you and I live not in three or four or five, but in ten dimensions. And uh, 
They, 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 you, if you read in this area, you'll encounter su uh, super strings and such, and I won't get, we have briefing packs on this for those that want to get into it more. The point being, we need to understand that the three dimensions you and I are familiar with are not all there is, there's more. Let's imagine, you and I can't move up. It'd be futile for me to try to communicate four, five, six dimensions to us without, to get together without having more mathematical tools. But what we can do is we can go the other way, and it may stretch our horizons here a little bit. You and I are three-dimensional beings. Let's imagine a two-dimensional world. That would be as like a, a large tabletop or a large flat plane. Now, and let's imagine that two-dimensional world populated by two-dimensional people. You and I could come along and poke our finger through the plane of their existence. And what would they see? They would see a circle. They'd only see that which they could relate to in their universe. But if, we're, if we as a three-dimensional being are putting our finger through that uh, uh, two-dimensional universe to the two-dimensional people in the two-dimensional universe, they would simply see a circle. Well, in fact, let's imagine that a ball fell through that two-dimensional universe. To the two-dimensional observer in that two-dimensional universe, he'd see from nothing to a point, it would be, it'd grow to a large circle, and then it would shrink back to a point and disappear. He wouldn't be able to relate to what happened because he doesn't have the, the insight of, of that third dimension. You with me so far? Now, if you had some other kind of a shape, say a tumbling cube, it also would go through and it would take odd shapes as it passed through and then disappear. So one of the problems we have, suppose, if, suppose you and I are going to try to communicate a three-dimensional object to that two-dimensional world. How would we go about it? Well, there's a couple of ways. One would be to do what the what an architect would call projection. For example, if we had a cube, we could, in effect, shine a light that would give you a profile of that in two dimensions. And you discover very quickly that that works, but it's not too useful in letting the two-dimensional person understand a three-dimensional cube. So there's another way you could do it. You could take a, a three-dimensional cube and you could unravel it. You could take it and just unfold it and lay it out, and that would be a way to communicate to this two-dimensional person what this three-dimensional cube is like. But you'd quickly discover as you tried to do that, his understanding is likely to be incomplete. You say, Chuck, what do you, what's all this got to do with anything? Well, <clears throat> let's talk about a four-dimensional cube. That's called in mathematics a Hinton cube, and uh, there are such things. Um, the, on, the only place I know of it, it's called a tesseract. That's an unraveled Hinton cube. This is a four-dimensional cube unraveled into three dimensions. You say, gee, what, what good is that? There's only one place I know of where this has actually been used constructively. And amazingly enough, it was by Salvador Dali. I never realized what a sophisticated mathematician he was, but in, in uh, his Corpus Christi painting, he actually has Christ on a four-dimensional cube as a cross, in, implying his mastery over time as well as space. And uh, I imagine there's probably not one observer in a hundred that really understands the sophistication that Salvador Dali was demonstrating by this piece of abstract art. But that's a Hinton cube or a tesseract, and that's the end. But anyway, let's get back to hyperspaces then. The main point I want to get across, you and I live in three spatial dimensions, and that time is a physical property. That's very important to us in our ministry because we know that the Bible is an integrated message, 66 books penned by 40 guys over thousands of years, and yet it's integrated, and not just thematically. The very design of the text itself evidences uh, integration. But what's mysterious about that, that integration also implies that the origin of that message is from outside the dimensionality of time because of the nature of its structure, its use of, uh, of writing history be before it happens, and so forth. So that's very important. Now, in particle physics, uh, they talk about ten-dimensional strings as the nature of our universe. What fascinates me about that is that that's exactly what two Hebrew scholars back in the 13th century, excuse me, 12th century, predicted just from their study of Genesis 1 is that we live in ten dimensions, four, are, four dimensions are knowable, and six are not knowable, to use their jargon. But in any case, the, the suggestion, it's the only one that we've encountered that really can reconcile what we think we know, is that the UFOs apparently are hyperdimensional. 
they apparently can enter our dimensional under certain conditions for certain periods of time. And uh, so let's see. Uh, now there's another aspect I'd like to touch upon about the, the, the whole UFO area. And getting back to the Roswell thing, why on earth is Roswell still classified? Why can't the American public or the world public be informed about what's really going on? It's all, it's all tightly classified. Well, back in 1984, an event occurred that uh, deserves some comment. In 1984, several documents emerged within the UFO community. One was a briefing addressed to President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower by Re uh, Rear Admiral Roscoe Hill Hillencutter, and it was dated 18 November 1952. And there was also a special classified executive order signed by Harry S. Truman to the Secretary of Defense in those days was James Forrestal. It was dated 24 September 1947. And his letter apparently authorized him to establish a board of suitably qualified persons to be answerable directly and only to the president. And the code name for this august group of appointees was Majestic 12. That was the code name. And these documents, all kinds of documents show up, uh, CIA documents and other things, including this memo that signed by Harry Truman uh, uh, establishing this, this august group. Now, who were, these, who were this, these group called Majestic 12? Well, one, of course, was James, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal, Rear Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter, who was prominent in those days, Dr. Vannevar Bush, who was probably the most famous scientist uh, of the period, General Nathan Twining, head of the Air Force, General Hoyt Vandenberg, Robert, General Robert Montague, and a number of civilians that you may not have heard of, Dr. Detlef Bronk, Dr. Jerome Hunsucker, Mr. Sidney Sowers, Mr. Gordon Gray, and uh, Dr. Lloyd Berkner. And one guy we will talk about a little bit is Dr. Donald Menzel. And uh, these were, uh, it, it, when Forstall died, by the way, in 49, General uh, 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 Walker Smith replaced him. But these 12 people apparently were known in the classified community, it would seem, as Majestic 12. Well, these are interesting people. You see, uh, of these 12, of 12 people, it was Secretary of Defense, of course, three of these people were the first three directors of the Central CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Actually, at, uh, the, the Director of Central Intelligence, that was the successor to the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, which later became the CIA. Five of these people were top scientists in aviation, research and development, and astronomy. All of these people held the highest security clearances anyway. Let's talk a little bit about Admiral Hillencutter. He was not, turns out, he was not simply a Navy man. And by the way, I want to mention something. Uh, a lot of people have heard about Majestic 12. And a lot of people also understand that it's been all debunked. But we're indebted to a very, very patient, thorough, diligent researcher by the name of Stanton Friedman who published a book on this, and what he did, uh, well, uh, uh, he, he developed dossiers, he spent 20 years developing dossiers on each of the 12 to try to understand as much as he could about their personal lives. Rear Admiral Hillencotter was not simply a Navy man, he was the first director of the CIA, which was also established, inter interestingly enough, in September of 1947, just months after the Roswell incident. He retired from the U.S. Navy in 57, and soon was appointed on the board of governors of NICAP, which was considered the most influential UFO organization in the 50s and 60s. Dr. Vannevar Bush, this is a name you probably heard. He's a world-renowned research scientist. He was the head of MIT between the two world wars and head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. He led the development of the atomic bomb, the proximity fuse, radar, and a hundred other high-tech uh, systems with military applications. See, that's why he's so well-known. He was also well-known for establishing a policy of compartmentalization of classified work. It was previously the style in research labs to give people a lot of freedom of movement. And he was the one that saw the need for compartmentalizing, letting scientists uh, have only the information they need to know so that they could control the, the, the uh, 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 transit of information uh, within the organization. So this whole idea of, we're going to talk about compartmentalization here shortly. 
Well, this whole MJ-12 there, there are two kinds of people, those that have never heard of MJ-12, and those that know that it's just, uh, been, it was just a hoax. You see, somebody noticed that the, apparently that the typewriter that was used to type the Truman Executive Order of 1947 was deemed a Smith Corona model and had not been manufactured until 1963. So you start to smell a hoax, if that's true. The signature on the memorandum, uh, memo <coughs> excuse me, the signature on the memorandum had apparently been photocopied from an unrelated letter that Truman wrote to Vannevar Bush back, uh, written in the uh, 1st of October of 1947. So you get the impression this thing was just a hoax. There are other anomalies that were noted and published in various media. So it quickly, within the UFO community, in just a few years, it was recognized by everyone that these documents were just fakes. And so most people either never heard of MG-12 or they, quote, know, close quote, that it was just a, a very elaborate hoax. Until Friedman comes along. Stanton Friedman, he was a nuclear physicist. He spent over a decade painstakingly probing 15 libraries and archives and he now has cast significant doubts about the doubters. He has refuted most of the documentation quibbles that were raised by the skeptics, but more importantly, he compiled detailed dossiers on each of the 12, and he's made some intriguing discoveries. See, by collecting the details on each one, some very interesting corroborations have emerged, and these are all published in his book, uh, Top Secret Magic, uh, in 1996. Let's take General Nathan Twining as an example. He had been scheduled to fly to Seattle on July 16th of 1947 to review the new B-50 bomber that was being built by Boeing at that time, and also to do some fishing with some old friends. So that was all scheduled for some time. Suddenly, General Twining canceled his Seattle trip and headed for New Mexico on July 7th. This is billed as just a routine inspection, but that doesn't jibe with the apparent urgency to upset all these other long-laid plans for no apparent uh, specific reason. It's also interesting that on July 9th, President Truman met with New Mexico Senator Chavez um, uh, with no reason given. So you get the feeling behind these calendar entries there's something going on. Another interesting guy is Donald Menzel. He apparently, Friedman discovers, had a, led a double life as a UFO debunker and a distinguished astronomer in public. He was a well-known astronomer. He also ran around poking holes at these UFO conjectures that were going on in those days. But it turns out he was also a linguist, a cryptographer, and a consultant to the National Security Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency for more than 30 years, and this was not known in the public. There's something Stanton found out by doing his homework. He held a top secret ultra clearance and none of this was known to the general public. So it's interesting, whoever contrived this hoax had a lot of inside information somehow. Now what's also provocative is Dr. Menzel, he gave some technical explanations disputing some UFO incidents that often were not scientifically defendable, especially for a guy like him who is a competent technologist. So it it's, it's strongly suggestive that he had a private agenda of disinformation as part of his job. So at this point, it may be useful to highlight, again, this is a little tutorial, which I'm going to call the anatomy of secrecy. How do you make something secret within the government or military community? Well, the first thing, you can, you can define the content of what's going on as secret or top secret or whatever level just is justified by the content of the material. If there's a contract, the content of the work can be classified secret, top secret, what have you. But let's assume you're really serious about making this especially secure. The other thing you can do is called compartmental, uh, compartmentalization. You can compartmentalize the project. And how do you do that? You make the existence of the contract classified. And uh, they, these are uh, usually in the intelligence community, and that's why they're, they go by a nickname. They're called black programs from the intelligence uh, side. Uh, these, are, these are great contracts to get because your competitors don't know they exist. So they're sole source, and uh, they're considered attractive uh, contracts. See, I, I have served as chairman of the board of f four different publicly traded defense contractors. And uh, uh, several of these were uh, companies that did, had their primary commitments in deeply classified work and uh, obviously included compartmentalized programs. 
But I have to tell you, I was startled. I spent 30 years in the strategic community, both in the Department of Defense community directly and also, as I say, uh, on boards and, uh, uh, of, uh, of publicly traded defense contractors. And I have to tell you, it was, was late in that 30-year career that I discovered, much to my amazement, there is another level of security, and that's where you make the existence of the customer classified. And I was uh, in one of those pro uh, projects, and uh, the, the, uh, it was a very, very strange meeting. We had a, uh, uh, our little company that uh, uh, was publicly traded, but not a large company, uh, was competing for a, a particular uh, procurement. And uh, the, the head of that particular division asked me, as chairman of the board and controlling shareholder, and, uh, and uh, 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 so on, to, to, to be president of the meeting, along with our banker, the vice president of... Uh, First Interstate Bank uh, was there, and uh, as we in this conference room, uh, three guys come in with business cards and give us their business cards, High Technology Research Associates or something like that. But quickly explain that that's just a cover, and we're not surprised. We, you know, that's what's known as a cutout, a, a, a shell corporation that they're using for uh, uh, you know, certain purposes. And uh, and they explained to us that. Um, uh, uh, we are, there are two, we're down to two companies, Our, ours, which is a smaller company, and another large company. One of the two companies is going to get, this is like on a Wednesday or Thursday, on Monday, one of these companies will be phoned and get the contract. And we're in the running. Okay, that's exciting. Um, but then they explain that they're very embarrassed because we'll get a verbal okay on Monday if we, if we win. But we'll have to start work right away to make the timing, and they won't be able to get paperwork to us for maybe 60 or 90 days. They're, they're embarrassed, but it, just, it takes that long to get the kind of paperwork we need. And so the problem is we're going to have to start on a verbal go-ahead before we have paper. And the problem with that is, is that they looked at our financials, and we weren't that financially strong to undertake that kind of a commitment. And so that's why they wanted a banker there. And so they said, Would, could the bank extend? We, I think we had a credit line in those days of, I think, four and a half million. It would take another million and a half to make us presentable for this purpose. And... Uh, and, I, and so they asked the bank if the bank could increase our credit line for a million and a half. And the banker very naturally said, you don't tell us who you are, and you won't tell us what, you know, what it's all about. The answer is no. And so we're at a stalemate, because as instead, we're not, we, we, we wouldn't be qualified. And uh, I turned to the first, vice president of First Interstate Bank. I says, you people have my personal financials. In those days, I had money. That's before I got in my project with the Russians. But anyway, um, they took me down. But the point is, in those days, I had a, a net worth. I said, you, you have a net worth. If I guaranteed the incremental loan, would the bank willing go along with this? And he said, I can't. He says he didn't have the authority, but we go downtown. He says that they'd probably go along with that. So I turned to the customer. I says, if I can pull that off in the next 24 hours, would that suffice? And they said, sure. So that's exactly what we did. I went downtown the next morning to First Interstate Bank. We signed some papers. And I guaranteed an additional, an incremental million and a half on the on existing four and a half million dollar loan on that Thursday or Friday, whatever it was. And that Monday, we did get a phone call, and we won this contract. And that was eight. It, it, it turned out to be the electronics for the B2. And uh, uh, it was um, 18 months later that that whole project got transferred to Northrop. But prior to that, it was in a in an organization whose existence is classified. And so. It, was, it startled me to discover that there's a whole procedure. There are uh, 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 cost uh, rec recovery procedures. There are courts. There's all kinds of all the necessary infrastructure to make this all work is in place, and it's all uh, highly classified to protect even the existence of the customer. That's the third level, if you will. You follow me? Well, one of the things that I want to, when you start talking about this, with that kind of a structure, how do you also really protect something that you're trying to keep secret? And one of the things you can do is have an active disinformation strategy. You not only keep it secret, you publish things to keep people from understanding what it is, discredited or whatever else. And we did that, for example, in the Manhattan Project during World War II. The very existence of our atomic, atomic bomb project, the so-called Manhattan Project, was hidden under a whole bunch of other cover stories and pseudo-projects. You went through certain doors, there were projects going on that really had nothing to do with anything, they were just a cover to hide what was really going on. Active disinformation. And one of the things I personally suspect is that's exactly what they did with MJ-12. It's very possible that they surface 
documents that have flaws in them, knowing that after a few months, few years, whatever, the diligence of researchers will discover that that couldn't have been that typewriter, that really isn't Truman's signature, whatever. So everybody knows that MJ-12 is just a big hoax. What a perfect cover. Ask anybody that's in this community about MJ-12, and they'll shrug it off right away. Oh, that's that, that hoax that surfaced in the 80s. Really. What a perfect cover. And obviously, if, uh, if I, I, I think it's real. I think it's continued. It obviously has gone under new names and so forth. But I suddenly began to realize that the debunking of MJ-12 may be very well. There's, there's a number of reasons I don't want to get into that caused me to suspect that that all was contrived. There have been some others like that, incidentally. So there's a continuing mystery. Why is somebody going to all this trouble to hide... For example, the Roswell stuff from f after 56 years, whatever it is, 57 years. Two presidents, four congressmen failed to penetrate the security surrounding the UFO-related issues. That's strange. By the way, a Canadian embassy inquiry was rebuffed in Washington, D.C. with the disclosure that the topic of UFOs enjoys a classification higher than our most secret warheads, the W-88s. They made an inquiry and they got turned down, but they made a mistake when they turned it down because they disclosed the fact that what they were after, which is some UFO information, was classified more highly than our weapon systems. Why? And uh, so, now by the way, just as we have Roswell in the United States, in England they have the famous Rendlesham Forest incident. And this is kind of interesting. On December 26th and 27th, the day after and then the next day of, of Christmas, in 1980, next, there was, there, there, there's a forest that's right next to a, a, a U.S. air base and a Royal Air, uh, uh, air Base at, at Woodbridge in Suffolk, uh, England. And in that forest, twice, two evenings in a row, a UFO landed. And... Uh, it was seen two nights into succession. It was tracked on radar by many of the military sites around there. Many people were involved. They rolled out uh, what they call light alls. That's like a, 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 draw, a, a car drawn trailer that has bright lights for various outdoor projects. They, they had that all set up when they landed. It was apparently scheduled somehow. And this was reported by Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt in a memo that was classified on both sides of the Atlantic. But a copy did get leaked out. And uh, the, so just as we have our Roswell mystery, in England they talk a lot about Reynolds and Forrest. What really happened there? There are lots of people involved, military, enlisted and others. So out of that have come all kinds of stories. Many of them are too afraid to even talk about it. Others that share incidents and they're very, just, just as they're bizarre tales about Roswell, there's even more bizarre tales about Reynolds and Forrest. Well, the good news is the UK government has announced the last few months that the Rendlesham file is going to be released. They're moving towards a Freedom of Information Act kind of posture, and apparently the Rendlesham Forest files, which have only been seen by about 20 people up until the release, and uh, so that's so for, there's we're in we're moving into a day when some of these mysteries are going to be uh, revealed. Now another thing that comes up when you talk about these topics are crop circles, and. Uh, and this might be a good ch chance for, the, for our TV people to change tapes if they want. So why don't I, let's take a five minute stretch break and let them collect themselves and we'll pick up crop circles and some subsequent things following, okay? <laughs>